I'm Wayne Walker, and welcome to our annual edition of the Best of Incredible Idaho. This year's theme is our wildlife heritage and the twin tools that wildlife professionals use to preserve this wonderful resource, solid research and knowledgeable management. These are the keys to maintaining nature's delicate balance in the face of disturbances such as disease, severe weather patterns, or destructive land use practices. Our first few stories focus on wildlife diseases. Domestic livestock introduced to North America by Europeans carried a variety of contagious bacteria. The native wildlife had never been exposed to these strains of disease and lacked natural immunities. And now, over 400 years later, we're just beginning to understand how this has affected America's wildlife. Nothing in their past could have prepared the European settlers for the sight of 60 million buffalo roaming the plains of North America. History tells us that it was these same settlers who indiscriminately hunted the beast to near extinction. But recent studies show that disease may have also played a role in decimating the herds. Whatever the reason for their demise, today one of the only remaining free-ranging herds has found a home in the isolated beauty of Yellowstone National Park. Little seems to threaten them here. The big lumbering beasts plod along, grazing the native plants, seemingly oblivious to the wondrous geysers and other geothermic marvels of this unique landscape. They've claimed dominance for the most part, ignoring photographers and tourists. In the last several years, bison populations have boomed in the park, threatening to outgrow the limited habitat. But despite appearances, disease still haunts the herd. Scientists estimate that at least half of the bison population carries a cattle disease brought over from Europe called brucellosis. Until recently, bison wandering outside the confines of the park into Idaho or Montana were shot in compliance with state law. The fear was that the big shaggy beast may transmit the disease to domestic livestock, threatening the brucellosis-free status of the beef industry in these states. It is a long, expensive process to earn this status, and the United States Department of Agriculture is understandably concerned about the danger of exposing cattle to the disease. But not all the bison carry brucellosis and there has been no documented incidence of Yellowstone bison transmitting the disease back to domestic animals. To avoid a potential crisis, the governors of the tri-state area surrounding Yellowstone formed a committee and charged it with the task of coming up with a plan for eradicating the disease. Okay, what we're gonna do this morning is mix up the drugs we use for bison mobilization. Drugs we're using are potent narcotics, Wildlife veterinarian Tom Roth is part of a group of scientists who are experts in their fields representing several state and federal agencies. They've teamed together to try and learn more about how brucellosis affects the Yellowstone bison. This morning, he's carefully injecting the captured darts with a dangerous drug called carfentanyl citrate. If a mere drop of this penetrates the skin, it could readily kill a human so gloves and eye protection are necessary precautions. Because uh, there are no other drugs that are very suitable for knocking down large animals like bison. The other real reason is that it is a drug that can be readily reversed. If you ever get into a trouble, you can stop the procedure and you can reverse what you've done. The plan seems relatively simple. Shoot the bison with a dart gun, take samples and fit a radio on each animal for a further study but factor in snow, travel restrictions in the park, and the belligerent disposition of most of these big intimidating beasts, and you have the makings for an exhausting day. Why don't you get ropes with lariat? Got lariats, both of them. Both of them, and thermometers. We're set for that atropine, ketamine backups. I think we're set. Eight female bison were captured and radio collared in the fall of 1995. On this winter excursion, the research team hopes to recapture those eight for more testing and radio collar two additional bison. The telemetry equipment indicates that somewhere in this open field, a buffalo is wearing a radio. 
This area of Yellowstone is off limits to snow machines, so the advance team struggles through the drifts the same way mountain men did over 150 years ago. The rest of the scientists follow cautiously, quietly awaiting word of a successful capture. Yeah, we're heading, uh, I would say, down Yancey's Hole. Yeah, that's where, it's, where the two buffalo are. They're, they're together. Um, you got to go past the footbridge. Females are targeted because studies have shown that the disease causes some animals to abort their fetuses. Whether it is domestic cattle, wild elk, or bison, instinct prompts the rest of the herd to clean up the birthing event, thus preventing the scent of blood from attracting predators. But this may also be the means of spreading the disease. Well, they've just shot the animal. Now we're waiting for it to go down. Once it goes down, and they're sure it's, it's going to stay down, not get back up, then, then we're going to uh, uh, rush in there and, and uh, make sure we, we get on her as soon as we can. As the scientists watch, the drugged female begins to stagger. A fellow member of the herd licks the wound in her hip for the dart injected. This raises another potential problem for the researchers. The shaggy beasts are inclined to protect their own. They gather around the faltering animal reluctant to abandon her. The scientists wave their hats and shout, but it takes the sharp noise of a cracker gun to finally disperse most of the herd. I don't think she got a full dose of animals. She's still not completely down, so wildlife veterinarian Dave Hunter creeps slowly up from behind and injects her by hand with another dose of the drug. Why don't you guys come around behind me? She's got her head turned that way. Even sedated, she's still dangerous. The next step is to restrain hooves and horns. Uh, the drugs we use, are, again, are very, very potent. And bison are very sensitive to these drugs. You'll see a lot of concern on, on our faces when we're handling these. We make a lot of decisions that when it's time to stop, it's time to stop and get them up. OK, guys. She's a little light, but she's had two injections. The team converges on the animal, working quickly to gather samples to take tests. A cloth is tossed over the bison's face to cover her eyes and hopefully help calm her. Oh, don't knock me down, sweetheart. The first critical test is to take a sample to check for brucellosis. Blood is drawn and spun in the field with a homemade battery-operated centrifuge. Ideally, Half of the radio collared animals will test positive for the disease, and the others will be like this female, free of brucellosis. Okay, this is a negative test. Each pregnant animal is being fitted with a device called a vaginal transmitter that is temperature sensitive. When the female gives birth, or in the event of an abortion, the transmitter will be forced out of the birth canal. The change in temperature will cause it to emit a warning signal to alert the researchers. So we can go out there to a birthing event, be able to take our samples, maybe get our hands on the calf and sample it to see if brucellosis is spread through the birthing events uh, uh, as suspected and to see what kind of levels we get. Okay guys, we're, we're starting to get the drug really good here. So if you can kind of expedite this, let's get her rolled and get out of her. Scientists okay, have already more. learned that there are oh, some right, bison right. that appear to be genetically resistant to brucellosis. We're taking samples, uh, studying the DNA, uh, looking for that gene to see what the proportion of resistant animals are here in the park. And uh, this is kind of a new technology and we don't know a lot about it yet, but it's kind of exciting. Come on, we need some gorillas in here, come on. After a bit of pushing and grunting, the bison is rolled over into a more comfortable position. The rest of the team quickly gathers up their gear while Dave administers a reversal drug to bring the animal out of the sedative. Yeah, she's breathing fine and she's starting to move this leg and I can see her heart rate coming up from here. I think she's going to be excellente. The Yellowstone bison have lived with brucellosis for at least 90 years and yet herd numbers are the highest they've been since mid-century. Is this the same strain as the cattle disease? Can it be transmitted to domestic livestock? Hopefully, the answers to these questions can be found in studying reluctant volunteers like this bison now trotting anxiously off to the safety of the herd.
Look at her go. She's still. Yep. She's, she's looking for the herd. She doesn't want to see any humans again. That's She'll be sure. harder to dart next She will. Time. She'll be a real tough she one. Will. Oh, well, she's a, she's a tough one. Okay. Let's go for this way. Hold on. Hey, hey, hey. Get her. I got her. I got her. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Okay. The plains buffalo were probably exposed to domestic livestock and their inherent diseases early in the 19th century. But the bighorn sheep, secluded by the protection of the harsh Rocky Mountains, escaped exposure to foreign bacteria. It wasn't until much later, near the turn of the 20th century, that white settlers began homesteading the more rugged areas of the American West. And along with courage, ambition, and fortitude, they brought in the necessities for survival. Their horses, goats, cows, and sheep, unknowingly exposing native wildlife to a host of new bacteria. Soon after, in Idaho's Hell's Canyon, the wild sheep population began crashing from a combination of overhunting, new diseases, and competition for grazing territory. By the 1930s, bighorn sheep were extinct in the area. But today, the wild sheep are back. Bighorns from Canada were transplanted to the Hell's Canyon area in the mid-70s, and with careful management, they began to slowly repopulate the area. But the threat of disease never seemed to leave the herd. Outbreaks of pneumonia caused by a bacteria called Pasturella haunted the Hell's Canyon wild sheep, nearly wiping them out in 1983 and again in 1991. By the fall of 1995, it seemed the herd was getting back on its feet. But during a routine census, biologists discovered over 20 dead sheep lying on the hillside north of the Grand Ronde River in Washington state. Those found alive appeared to be sick and coughing. With funding donated from a sportsman's group called the Foundation for North American Wild Sheep, a massive rescue operation was launched. This is probably the greatest blow to what we're trying to do, you know, possible. We're in the middle of uh, trying to restore big one sheep all the way from here up to Hell's Canyon Dam. The whole restoration program seemed in jeopardy. The options were to either kill every wild sheep in the area to prevent the disease from spreading, or try and capture the bighorns, hold them in captivity, and treat them with antibiotics, something never attempted before. Certainly a very large percentage of them percentage will probably die within the next few days. A lot of them have died in the last few days. Along the bluffs bordering the Snake River, the helicopter darts in and out of sight. It's closing in on a group of bighorns. Now, if you watch carefully, you can just make out their white rumps as they try to dodge the net. Back at base, the word comes in of a successful capture. We got three. As the captured sheep are being unloaded, the helicopter crew reports seeing several bighorn carcasses strewn along the hillsides. But the good news is they're also seeing live sheep, and before long, they're back in the sky hunting for more animals to capture. Uh, if you need a swab from her, she's 107. We're going to put her in the trailer right away as soon as we do, do our swab. Yeah, 107, we're really starting to get concerned. Antibiotics are administered and blood samples are quickly taken from each sheep. Then individuals are marked with numbered ear tags. As soon as an animal is processed, it's carried over to the trailer. Hobbles and blindfolds are removed, and then as gracefully as possible, the bighorn is pushed in. Hold on. Hey, hey, hey! Get her! I got her, I got her. Calm down, calm down. Calm down. Okay, hold on, hold on. Wildlife veterinarian Dave Hunter says the captured animals are showing some symptoms of sickness, such as particularly harsh breathing and runny noses. We'll see. They're all getting prophylactic treatment with two different antibiotics so that we can kind of cover it till we find out what we have. In the course of two days, 58 bighorn sheep were caught and transported over 300 miles south to the Wildlife Health Laboratory in Caldwell, Idaho. 
A week later, 14 more were captured, bringing the total to 72. Amazingly, despite the stress of being taken from the wild, none of the sheep died. Then suddenly, the week before Christmas, three of the captured bighorns succumbed to disease. It was only the beginning. By February 15th, only 12 of the original 72 wild sheep remained alive. Yeah, it's frustrating because if you're acting as health care provider, you'd like to think you can keep them alive. But this group was different from the start. Vigilant observation, daily treatments with antibiotics, IV fluids, even the intensive care provided at the Wildlife Health Lab couldn't keep the bighorns from dying. But the effort wasn't in vain. The carcass of each dead animal contains clues that may help find an answer to fighting the disease in the future. And, and that's what we want, to be able to have bighorn sheep so our great-grandkids are out there and say, my mom and dad had something to do with keeping those animals on the hill. In this next segment, we're going to take you through the basic steps of opening up an animal to perform a necropsy. Now, if you're squeamish, be forewarned, it will be graphic. But if you were the sort who enjoyed your high school science classes, you'll find it fascinating. Hey, yeah, that's why God gave you legs. Necropsies and autopsies are a critical element of medical science and one of the first steps in discovering the cure to disease in both animals and humans. We, we want to look in, in the animal as a whole after it dies, see if we have any other factors that might have been influenced the pneumonia, see if we have anything else going on in any of the other vital organs. Samples taken from earlier carcasses showed that the antibiotics had stopped the spread of the deadly bacteria that was killing the sheep on the mountainside. But in the meantime, other strains of pastorella were manifesting themselves in the bodies of the captive bighorns. Each time the veterinarians would treat and control one kind of bacteria, another would appear. And if you would have asked me when we took these animals on December 2nd or 3rd, whatever day it was, if uh, how many of them survive even during a pastoral outbreak, I said we could have saved 50%. And by God, <laughs> it's depressing that we can't. And uh, we found five or six major pathogens in these guys. Many of the sheep dying at the health lab are actually succumbing to septicemia, or blood poisoning. This means that bacteria or its toxins have entered the bloodstream. The villain in this case is a form of pastorella called multocida. And we'll find lesions in the liver, maybe kidneys, brain. Once these animals die, we can usually culture pastorella out of just about any organ in the body. And that's why it's so devastating, these poor little guys. Even to the untrained eye, the animal's lung is probably the most dramatic indication of disease. As Dave points out, there's a distinct line between the dark, infected lower part of the lung and the pink, healthier upper section. We take a piece of lung up here where this animal was breathing and a piece of lung down here that was really infected with the bacteria. Dave puts the healthy portion into a glass of water. It floats because it contains air. This is how the animal breathes. But the lower part of the lung is so consolidated with infection, it promptly sinks, demonstrating that it no longer can carry oxygen. You can see the difference between the healthy portion or the more healthy portion of the lung where this animal is breathing, it's probably a third of, of the total lung capacity. The other two thirds was completely wiped out by the pneumonia. Despite the tragedy of losing these big horn sheep, the effort has uncovered information that would have taken decades to gather in the field. Most importantly, we've learned that bighorns will carry some strains of pastorella in their bodies no matter what antibiotics are administered. Now, whether that bacteria becomes deadly depends somewhat on outside stresses, but largely on the animal's own immune system. It seems there are some wild sheep that are genetically resistant to this disease. Keep in mind, bighorns have only been exposed to these new bacteria for about a hundred years. It may take many more generations and some genetic diversity before the animals evolve into a species that can more effectively fight the pastorella bacteria. But perhaps we can accelerate the pace. One option would be through transplant operations. 
The next time wild sheep are brought from Canada to supplement the Hell's Canyon herd, perhaps we could attempt to choose animals that have this resistant gene. Geneticists have made huge strides in mapping human DNA, and now this exciting new science is beginning to be applied to wildlife. And the Wildlife Health Lab in Caldwell is pioneering this genetic work in bighorns. Well, it's very exciting, very exciting, very, very stimulating. You know, we don't want this to happen again. Another important tool in wildlife management is big game counts. They're conducted each winter to determine how well our wildlife populations have fared over the last year. This information is then used to help set hunting seasons. Our state is divided into 99 hunting units. Every year on a rotating basis, fish and game flies a portion of those units that are important big game habitat. Our flight will take us over unit 22, a strip of beautiful mountainous country located between Brownlee and Hell's Canyon dams known for its large herds of deer and elk. The producer of our show, Sue Nass, switched camera sides for our next story. She rode along with helicopter pilot Jim Pope and tried her hand at counting wild animals from a helicopter. The earth drops away as we slowly pick up speed. It's a different experience than flying in a fixed-wing airplane. Surrounded by plexiglass, the Hiller helicopter gives the sensation of being suspended in mid-air, nothing beneath your feet and the whole world in front of you. In the distance, Brownlee Reservoir winds through steep foothills, and immediately beneath us, power lines march up from the dam, creating a possible hazard for unsuspecting helicopters. The Hiller helicopter works really well because the pilot sits in the middle and the observers sit on the outside, so they, they have the best, uh, best view. It's easy to get caught up in the view and forget why we're flying, but we're brought back to reality by pilot Jim Pope, who spots our first group of animals. Well, if you look straight ahead there, you'll see about a couple hundred elk coming up on Oh, yeah. What you usually do is first you, you, you sight the... Uh, first sight the animals, you try to get a total number while you're coming in. Okay, right here, Sue, see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now it'd be your job to get a total number before they start moving. Yeah. the easiest time to count. I got two. Well, that seemed pretty easy, but before I could get too confident, Jim explained the next step. The counting the total number is really quite simple. All this from the air? Our earlier confidence drains away as we take a second pass at our group of deer. You try to pick the smaller ones out of there at first. Okay. And then like, when you think you have a small one, look at his... Like the last one to the left looks smaller uh, and it looks darker. Right. Two on the rear there are both fawns. Oh. That's about the only fawns in there. Wow, that's tough. We get pretty close, don't you? This area is one of the best sources in the state for long-term trend data on deer populations. 
It's been surveyed since 1960 and has averaged about 2,500 deer. This number escalated in the late 80s. But deer are subject to weather trends, and several years of drought, followed by a harsh winter, took its toll on the herd. Wildlife biologist Jeff Rollman has been tracking Unit 22 for the last decade. The winter of 92, 93, which most people in southern Idaho are pretty familiar with, we lost a lot of our deer. Um, our herds took a pretty severe drop, and uh, and so it, you know we've been monitoring them every year since to, to follow the, the growth. And so far, it's looking like we're get, recovering pretty well. We're getting up almost back to those late 80 figures. Elk are a hardier breed and seem less susceptible to weather trends. It looks like a small army marching up the hill in endless numbers. Now, when you come up on a group of elk this size, if they're spread out like these are, you try to get your number, your total number count before you do any classifying. Wow, that's a lot to count. So, you have to learn to count quickly, you know, get it before the elk move. I fail miserably, losing track of the sections I've already counted as they cross and blend into a larger group. They don't seem real spooked by the helicopter. No, they don't, uh, unless you get right, right over them. Uh, there's very little movement on these elk. It doesn't bother them that much. The next herd we spot is a bit more manageable for a rookie observer. I counted 25 on our first pass. The adult males don't lose their antlers until mid-March or early April. So the next step is to get a number on the bulls. I see four bulls. Okay. Um, now you got to now you have to uh, age them like to the size. You'll have spikes, branch antler. Most of those are spikes in there, young yeah. two and a half year old. Looks like about three calves maybe. Jim swings the helicopter around yeah. for another look. He's been flying big game counts for the fish and game department for over 25 years, and his experience shows. Calves will have a dark stripe down their back, darker than the adults, all the way to their shoulders, short head, and they should be smaller. The herd crests the ridgeline and splits, giving us a spectacular panorama of elk, mountain, and skyline as we pull away. Although this manner of counting wild animals seems wonderfully exotic, and a bit overwhelming to the first-time observer, in reality, it's actually a very methodical process. Well, like I say, we contour 500-foot elevations, and, and uh, pilot, um, that's more or less his responsibility to keep track of the groups and make sure you don't recount. Lots of times, the, the group of animals will work uphill on you, so you have to be careful of that. We spotted three big bull elk with huge racks moving up the mountainside. The older bulls tend to hang together in what biologists call bachelor groups. They keep to the higher country, away from the cows, calves, and younger spike bulls. Jim demonstrates the amazing maneuverability of the helicopter, swinging the ship around so we can get another look at the big bulls. It's a beautiful sight, and one Jim never tires of, no matter how often he flies big game counts. Oh, it's a living. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I hesitate to guess how many deer and elk I've looked at in my lifetime. It's a number. See, there's one white tail in there with a couple of mule deer. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, look at that tail. Habitat loss and overhunting by white settlers at the turn of the century often decimated the local wildlife. But in the last several decades, biologists have been successful in reestablishing various populations of wild animals back into their historic habitat. Next, we'll go along on a mountain goat capture. Since 1960, 232 of these shaggy beasts have been captured from healthy populations and transplanted into new areas. But it's not an easy operation. In fact, it can prove to be extremely tedious and frustrating. It's 
It takes a solid month of preparation to plan the complicated logistics involved in moving people and equipment to the secluded habitat of the mountain goat, the 7,000-foot ridge on the edge of the Mallard Larkin Wilderness in north-central Idaho. It's called Black Mountain, a rocky, barren peak that's capped by a Forest Service lookout home to the trapping crew for the next week. Everything necessary to the operation is slung up the slope by a Jet Ranger helicopter. Sleeping bags, food, water, and the tools of the trade, equipment like these wooden crates designed for transporting captured goats. So we'll set these boxes up over here and then we'll have them all ready for if we get any goats. After several trips slinging gear, the ship lands and the rest of the captured crew disembarks. An eerie silence descends as the helicopter pulls away. The dreamy sense of isolation is deepened by the encroaching fog and a cold, steady rain creating less than ideal conditions for capturing goats. But the crew's already in action, setting up the big rectangular contraptions called clover traps. They set the, the salt in the back of the trap, and the goats have been salted here for oh, 20, 30 years, something like that, so they're pretty used to it. And uh, <clears throat> so they'll come in and, and come into the trap to get to the salt, and uh, we kind of have a, a hook hooked up to this drop gate and then a trigger wire, and uh, when they get inside, we pull the trigger and the gate drops and we got them. It's a simple design, and that simplicity makes it almost foolproof. Monofilament line is strung from the gate of each trap to the lookout. This is the trigger. We're putting rocks around the edges, and we'll, we'll wire the trap down to the rocks and try to secure it because, yeah, otherwise they'd carry it off. Somehow, the efforts of the biologists invoke visions of the classic cartoon where the coyote is always trying to design elaborate ways to trap the roadrunner. That ought to work, I think. But unlike the frustrated coyote of cartoon fame, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game has a remarkable track record catching and transplanting mountain goats. Since 1960, 41 successful capture and transplant operations have been conducted. The goal? To supplement those goat populations that appear to be on the decline and to establish new populations in historic habitat where the mountain goats have disappeared, like the Seven Devils area above Hell's Canyon. People moved in and miners were around, a lot of folks were on the river, probably the population just got over hunted. And uh, it was quite a long time where there were no goats and then we transplanted goats into there and now there's about 120 to 140 goats in that population. Every four to six years, aerial surveys are flown over the craggy mountain ranges of Idaho to evaluate the health and density of our wild goat populations. Here on Black Mountain, goats have always been plentiful. The most recent surveys reporting approximately 200 mountain goats in the vicinity, establishing it as a population that can comfortably support a capture and transplanting operation. It's the nanny with the kid there. There's instant tension in the lookout when goats are sighted the first afternoon. They appear wary. The nanny is clearly not interested in approaching the salt once she realizes the lookout is occupied. But the kid peeks curiously at probably its first sight of humans and then disappears. A little wishy-washy. The appearance of goats so soon after setting the traps is a good sign, and hopes are high in the lookout that a capture may be imminent. But even the best intentions of man are still subject to the whims of nature. That was to be the only sighting of mountain goats for three long, slow days. By evening, the clouds have thickened, shrouding the lookout in a dense fog. A cold, steady drizzle further isolates the peak. Somewhere, the mountain goats have taken cover from the foul weather, weather more suited to early spring than these long days of summer. Special recipe, Black Mountain pancakes. If possible, the next morning, the weather is even worse. The lookout is swallowed in a fog bank, and visibility is down to virtually zero. There's little to do but wait out the weather. <laughs> 
Well, this has been nasty weather. Um, in years past, we've it seems like we've been blessed with a lot of warm, sunny weather and blue skies, but we've, we've had a lot of rain. Uh, wind, rain, wind, fog, clouds, uh, some, near, some close calls with thunderstorms. During sunny weather, they tend to get out and move a lot more. For the next two days, clouds roll in and out in great waves. In between rainstorms, the crew searches the surrounding slopes for sign of goats. But either they are well hidden or right beneath the peak, tucked into the rugged cliffside below. The days are long and time passes slowly. Then finally, the fourth day dawns bright and sunny. The clouds have settled into the valleys, freeing the mountain to bask in sunshine for the first time since the crew's arrival. The view from 7,000 feet is spectacular, stretching from the Mallard Larkin Wilderness all the way to Montana. Big sky country indeed. The warmth has nudged the goats into activity and soon they appear, seeking the salt their bodies crave. For a few moments, the traps are forgotten. And the biologists indulge in the rare sight of these unusual creatures moving effortlessly through the rocks and crevices. Oh, they're just fun to watch. They, it's fun to watch their habits. Um, they're just like a, unlike any other animal, you know. They're up against the rocks all the time, and you just wonder how they can move through those rocks uh, so quietly and without falling and so forth. One thing that goats have is on their hooves, they have a pad that uh, <clears throat> spreads out a little bit, which helps them to uh, cling onto the rocks a little better than, than when an elk or a deer would. You can't take her, she's got a kid. More goats have joined the first two, some still wrapped in their thick winter coats. Others are already slicked off, displaying the powerful chest and leg muscles that make them so well suited for this mountain habitat. They circle the peak tentatively, eyeing the salt in the strange mesh trap. You'd probably take about any of these other three. This first one's pretty big. The ideal captures are goats that are small enough to handle, but old enough to be on their own. Nannies with kids are automatically eliminated, as well as the larger females and big billies. Not only are the massive, mature goats difficult to deal with, the fact that they are older means they have fewer years left to reproduce and populate a new area. There's a little kid standing down here. <laughs> here comes another one. More and more goats appear. One is instantly dubbed Crazy Horns for the odd angle of its headgear. I'd take all of them, but Crazy Horns and maybe the one on the rock. The goats drift around to the side, heading towards the back, where the biologists have a third trap. The atmosphere in the lookout is thick with tension, and conversation is limited to urgent whispers. Here we go. Here we go. Come on. Swing around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going in. It's going in. A display of dominance disrupts the process as one goat challenges another, chasing him away from the trap. But the others remain tempted by the scent of salt. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Take him, George. Got it. The crew is instantly in action grabbing a crude wooden shield as they dash out to the trap. The goat is frantic. It tries to escape, crashing against the sides. Both horns and hooves are dangerous, and it's critical that one of the trap crew gets a solid hold on the tossing head. The goat bucks and squirms, attempting to break out, and it takes the efforts of the whole crew to subdue it. Sections of garden hose are put in place to protect the scientists from the sharp horns, and a blindfold helps calm the goat. Then the work begins of processing the animal. 
I'm uh, writing down information that we collect on it, put down the ear tag number. Um, we've got the radio number down right here already. We're gonna take some blood and uh, then that'll be about it. Is it 67, George? It's a three-year-old female. The blood will be sent to a lab for disease testing and genetic work. And the radio collar will help biologists keep track of how well she adapts to her new surroundings at the release site. But for now, she'll be temporarily housed in this wooden crate. I got her head. I got her head. I got her head. I don't have anything yet. It's a struggle, but eventually she's loaded into the crate. Okay, why don't you guys mess with this? I'll go get the other hand. Okay. A somewhat battered and bruised trapping crew carries the crate okay, down the snowy it. slope away from the trap site. They set it down carefully under a tree where she will be protected from the sun, then return uphill to reset the trap for the next unwary goat. Got it? Okay. Right here. Now, if you think that was rough, imagine the same process in the fog, in the dark, and on a cliff. Sound a little dicey? Well, when we come back, we'll show you what it's like to catch a mountain goat in the gloom of night. Well, he's smaller than I thought. Easy. You ready? One of the advantages to the big clover traps is that no drugs are necessary to subdue the animal. This usually means a dramatically better survival rate for captured wildlife. But once in a while, an individual animal is lost. Usually it's due to stress. The animal just reacts poorly to the whole situation. And occasionally, but rarely, the captured creature is injured in the trapping process. Now until a necropsy is performed, we won't know the reason. But the goat you just saw captured was found dead the following morning. It was a subdued crew the next day. The trapping operation seemed to be plagued with bad luck. First, the lousy weather and lack of goats, and then the loss of a captured animal. Wildlife biologists realize that losing individual animals is part of the process, but it's still tough. It's necessary to remember that without the transplant operations, there would not be the strong goat populations we have scattered throughout our state today. A blanket of cloud cover keeps the goats from moving around and there are no sightings near the traps. The only highlight of the day is a gorgeous sunset. The helicopter is scheduled to return the next morning and it looks as though the whole operation has been a wash. Fog follows the sunset, rolling in with the darkness and then under the cover of night, another chance. It's a lone goat. The lamps are quickly dimmed and once again, tension pervades the lookout. Oh, well, he's smaller than I thought. Easy. It's not as large as the first goat and appears a bit less agitated. A distinct advantage in this trap perched so closely to the edge of the cliff. But even though this young female is smaller, it's still a struggle. The process is the same. The first priority is to secure her flailing hooves and then get some protection on the sharp horns. The biologists struggle in the dark to put on the blindfold, ear tag, and the radio collar. Blood is taken, and then the challenge to move her over the rocky cliff into the crate. The next morning, the goats are slung out first. The carcass of the dead goat will be sent to the Wildlife Health Laboratory in Caldwell for a necropsy. The goat captured in the night will be transported by truck and then slung by helicopter to a place called Squaw Creek above the Salmon River in the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. There, it will join up with eight mountain goats released previously at the same site to pioneer a new population. Right up in that saddle, uh, beyond those two trees right here, where when recreationists and other folks go into that area, it's nice for them to see it like it really was before 
man really got here. And when some of those wildlife populations are missing, they really can't get the full experience. So for me, it's real satisfying to put those populations back in there so that people can, can see them. You know, and just see what the wilderness and the country was like 100 years ago. Okay, you get out of the way and I'll let her feet go. Get out of the way of the horns. Okay. Traditionally, we end our program with video essays. For this, we'll use portraits of Idaho wildlife. Da 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 da